Hey everyone, welcome back. In this ISTQB exam question and answers video, I'm going to cover another five exam questions with detailed explanation. So till now we have covered until 30, question number 30 of exam question set C. And now in this video, I'm going to cover 31st question till, till 35th. So first question of this video says at the beginning of each iteration. Okay. So this is mostly, you know, agile development approach and the question from that. So they are referring to at beginning of each iteration, the team estimates the amount of work in person days. Okay. They will need to complete during that iteration. Let E of N. Okay. Where N is basically the iteration. Okay. So E of N is the estimated, be the estimated amount of work for iteration N and A of N is actual amount of work for iteration n. So for example, if the iteration is one, then E is estimated A is actual of that particular iteration. From the third iteration, the team uses the following estimation model based on extrapolation. So they have came up with this particular formula and from third iteration, they are using this particular model to uh, based on the extrapolation to identify or estimate. Okay. The graph shows the estimated and actual amount of work for the first four iterations. So below is the graph that shows the first four Four iterations what was the actual and what was the estimated now what the question is what is the estimated amount of work for iteration 5 okay so until 4 iteration or a sprint they have given you the graph they have given you the formula and they are asking what is the estimated amount of work for iteration 5 so what we have to do is we have to simply use this particular formula replace the values for the fifth iteration okay so what they are asking is iteration 5 all right. So basically, if they are asking iteration five, so n becomes five, right? Which is basically n is the iteration. Okay. So they are asking for the iteration five. So let's try to work out that particular formula. And what they are asking is they are asking the estimation for estimated amount of work for iteration five. So estimation of five. So if we replace everything, so let me work out here. So estimation of fifth iteration. So basically, if we talk about the formula, it says three multiplied by actual of n. n is what? Fifth iteration. So five minus one plus, okay, in bracket, and then actual of n is again five, right? So five minus two. So this is the formula. We have replaced the n with five, okay, and divided by four. So if we work that out, three multiplied by a five minus four is basically a four, right? So a of four. So that means actual of fourth iteration and then actual of five minus two is three. So actual of third iteration and actual of fourth iteration. So what is actual of fourth iteration and actual of third iteration we'll get from the graph. So actual of third iteration, if you'll see the iteration number three and four, we have to get now actual is this lighter shade, right? And estimated is the darker shade. So actual of third iteration was eight. If you see this particular height, it is basically eight, right? And actual of fourth iteration is six. Okay. So we replace that actual of third and actual of fourth with eight and six. So actual of fourth was actual of fourth was six and actual of third was eight. So now if we have to calculate this, so we say three multiplied by actual of fourth was six and actual of third was eight divided by four. So we multiply this first. So 18 plus eight divided by four. And that is basically, so if we just work it out, 26 divided by four. So which is, which comes to six and 6.5, right? So four times six, 24, and then remaining is two. So we put the, uh, or do the decimal calculation and four times five is 20. So 6.5 is what the estimation of the fifth iteration should be as per, per this extrapolation formula. Okay. So pretty simple calculation. You simply have to refer to the graph and how you are going to work out the iteration that they are asking. Okay. So the correct answer will be 6.5, which is basically C. So any such formula based question, we just have to select one option. Any such formula based question, you just have to don't panic. Make sure you understand what exactly they are asking, read the question properly, and then whatever graph and formula is given, you work that out accordingly. Formula is pretty simple. We just had to do a little bit of calculation to arrive to this particular percentage number for iteration five. Okay. So that's the correct answer for this particular question. Now moving to the next question of this particular video, you are preparing a test execution schedule for executing seven test cases from TC1 to TC7. The 
following figure includes the priorities of these test cases. One is the highest priority and three is the lowest priority. Okay, that's fine. Seven test cases, three priorities, one is highest, three is lowest. Now, the figure shows the dependencies as well. So, what are dependencies between the test cases? That's also shown using the arrows. For instance, the arrow from TC4 to TC5 means, so from TC4 to TC5 means that you cannot, TC5 can only be executed if TC4 was previously executed. That means this arrow shows if you have to execute TC5 first, the TC4, TC5 is dependent on TC4, then TC7 is also dependent on TC4. That's what this arrow means. TC2 you cannot execute independently because TC2 is dependent on TC1. That's what this arrow is uh, means. This is what they are referring here. Now based on this diagram and the priority and the number of test cases, what they are asking is what test case should be executed sixth. Okay, so now we have to figure out which test case you are going to execute in the sixth number based on the priority and how you are going to execute and the dependency, right? So couple of things here. So you have to work out priority wise, you have to pick the highest priority test cases to be executed first. Okay, but if highest priority test case is dependent on other test case, that means you cannot execute that test case independently. So that means you have to execute other test cases first to execute that higher priority test case, right? So that's where both things come in picture and that's this is you apply on day to day basis in your testing projects, right? So that's why they are asking these sort of questions. So now if we have to work out what will be executed on the sixth number. So if we talk about the first priority test cases, th those test cases are five and seven. So that means whenever there is a priority and dependency, priority is takes precedence, right? So first priority test case will always be executed or highest priority test cases should always be executed first. So that means TC7 if we talk about, right? And TC5 if we talk about. For TC5 to execute, we have two different test cases to execute, right? For TC7, we just have one test case, TC4, which is priority two. So basically, we'll start with TC7, right? because this is priority one and it just needs one another test case it's dependent on just one more test case one uh, one test case but if we pick tc5 this is also priority one why are we not picking up this first because this is dependent on two more test cases so it will basically consume more time so we'll start with one because this will help us so it's seven we can go ahead and execute by this order so tc4 followed by tc7 so this priority one is covered right even though tc4 is is the second priority it will be executed as a first test case why because in order to execute the first priority test case tc7 this is dependent on tc4 okay then we come to the next highest priority which is tc5 why we took tc5 as the second test case to be executed because this is basically dependent on tc tc1 tc2 and also tc4 you will see that there is a dependency on tc4 so tc5 was dependent on three test cases not only two so tc4 we have already already executed now in order to execute tc5 we'll go ahead and execute tc1 followed by tc2 and then tc5 okay so now if we talk about we have executed one two three four five okay so now we have executed five they are asking which one will be executed as the sixth test case so now these five test cases have been executed and this is the only priority based on the priority order this is how we are going to execute these now out of tc6 and tc3 these two are the ones that are left but tc6 is priority 3 and tc3 is priority 2 so which one will pick first we'll pick the priority higher priority test case first so at the sixth number we will execute tc3 right tc3 will be executed at the sixth number and then tc6 okay so at the sixth number what will be the test case that will be executed is tc3 and tc3 is the a option so a is the correct option restore all incorrect okay so the correct answer for this particular question is test case 3 will be executed as the as sixth test case so make sure you work start working with the priority and then based on the priority you pick the highest priority once first only if the dependent test cases are less right why we pick tc7 as the first test case because it was dependent on only one test case tc5 was also same priority right but we picked that later because this is dependent on three test cases so that's why we came up with this particular order okay so now moving to the next question question number three of this particular video what does test pyramid model show simple question we just have to select one option right so no not too much calculation work out here so what does test pyramid model show more of a theoretical so if you see the test pyramid model 
right? So UI API unit, right? So basically how the tests are basically segregated or how, what is the level of detail of the coverage of test or where the testing should focus more. Okay. So the test pyramid model show the test may have different priorities. Test may have different granularity. Test may require different coverage criteria and test may depend on other tests. Okay. So if we talk about last option, tests may depend on other tests. Absolutely not. This is not what test pyramid model shows. Tests may require different coverage criteria. That's also not correct, right? Different coverage criteria is not what the test pyramid shows. It shows different level of granularity, right? So second option is the correct option. Test may have different level of granularity. For example, if we talk about the UI test cases, that will have a different granularity. Unit test case will have more of more granular. API will be little less granular as compared to the unit test case, right? So B is the correct option for this test pyramid model and tests may have different priorities. No, that's not what the test pyramid model shows. So the correct option is B for this particular question. Now moving to the third or fourth question of this particular video. What is the relationship between the testing quadrants, test levels and test types? Okay. Again, theoretical question. We just have to select one, one option. Now the relationship between testing quadrants, agile testing quadrant, test level and test type. Let's read this. Testing quadrants represent particular combinations of test levels, test types, defining their location, software development, life cycle. Testing quadrants describe the degree of granularity of individual test types performed at each, at each test level. Now, this we just saw at the top that Granular, granularity of individual test type is depicted by test pyramid, not the testing quadrant. So we can straight away cross that out. Okay. Sometimes you will find that two questions are very correlated and you can easily cross the options that you have covered in the previous question. So we simply got rid of one of the option. Now the C option shows uh, testing quadrants assign the test types that can be performed to the test levels. And the fourth option says testing quadrants group test levels and test types by several criteria criteria such as targeting specific stakeholders. So this looks the most accurate answer. Okay. Why? I'll go ahead and cover the others. So testing quadrants assign test types that can be performed to the test level. Absolutely baseless. This is not what testing quadrants is all about. Testing quadrant, test level, and test type. Uh, testing quadrant does not assign the test types that can be performed to the test levels, right? So for a test level, what test types can be performed? That's not what testing quadrant is all about. Testing quadrant is more of a grouping of the test cases, which is basically the last option. Let's go and exclude the first option as well. Well, testing quadrants represent particular combination of test levels and test types defining their location in software development lifecycle. So combination of test level and test type and the location in SDLC, that's not what test testing quadrant does. Okay, so the correct answer is D. Why? Because testing quadrant group test levels, okay, where exactly the unit testing is, functional testing is, and the testing type in a particular quadrant by several criteria. And one of the criteria is specific stakeholder, whether, whether the test type and the level focuses or helps the developers or is technology facing or is business facing or helping business stakeholders or end users. That's what this, it helps the specific stakeholders criteria such as targeting specific stakeholders. So D is the correct option for relationship between testing quadrant, test levels and test types. Okay. Now moving to the last question of this particular video, which of the following is an example of how product risk analysis may influence the thoroughness and scope of testing. Now product risk, risk analysis, how product risk analysis may influence thoroughness and scope of testing, right? So we have to select one option based on the product risk analysis, what can influence the thoroughness? So continuous risk monitoring allows us to identify emerging risk as soon as possible. That is that is not influencing a risk analysis that influences the thoroughness, right? Of the uh, uh, thoroughness and scope of testing. That's not the correct option. Okay. You can clearly see this is out of the context. Now the next one says risk identification allows us to implement risk mitigation activities and reduce risk level. Now that is also not talking about the thoroughness of testing, right? This is more of risk identification allows us to implement risk mitigation activities and reduce the risk level. Generic statement about risk identification and mitigation. So this is also not talking about thoroughness and scope of testing. 
Third option says the assessed risk level helps us to select the rigor of testing, right? This is about rigor of testing and based on assessed risk level. So this is how product risk analysis influences thoroughness and scope of testing. The assessed risk level help us to select the rigor, how rigorous the testing would be. If the risk is very high, critical, then we have to choose depending rigor of testing, depending on the risk analysis. So C is the correct option. Option, but let's go through the D as well. Risk analysis allows us to derive coverage out items. That's also not talking about the thoroughness and scope of testing. So D is also incorrect. C is the correct answer for this particular last question. The assess risk level help us to select the rigor of testing. Okay. So that's basically the last question of this particular video. In the next one, I'll cover another five exam questions with detailed explanation. Thank you. See you in the next one.